Hey, good morning, folks. And uh, welcome to our COIL conversation today with uh, apparently all presenters who must have the first name of Kyle. Uh, Kyle Bone and Kyle Peck. And uh, they're going to be speaking to the transformational force in higher education and Penn State's response. So I first have to start off by telling you what a pleasure it is to have these two gentlemen with us. Um, Kyle, I was trying to figure out how long I've known you and worked with you, but uh, I, I, I want to say you joined Penn State in the early 90s? 87. 87. So 30 okay, years. Good, good. And Kyle Bone's been with us for three years now? Three years. And I've really enjoyed working with Kyle and uh, Kyle and Kyle. So both, both of the Kyles are, are on, serve as a COIL director uh, uh, guides for us. Uh, Kyle Peck in particular has been just instrumental in helping us getting started up in COIL five years ago helping us design our rig programs and our COIL conversations and so forth. So it's, it's such a great pleasure to be here uh, with these two. Very quickly, I'm just going to give you a little background on, on Kyle Bowen first. Um, Kyle previously was the director of analytics at Purdue. Correct. OK. And, uh, and did some really great things there. Came to Penn State five years ago. Has been serving as the director of educational technology services, where and, and most of you are going to know already the kinds of services they provide. Um, and then Kyle just, we were just speaking about this earlier, Kyle's mind right now is on several small things like the snow coming in tonight uh, and a small program they have organized for Saturday uh, this week and hoping that goes well. So we'll, we'll, once this is done, he'll be on coast mode. Okay. Kyle Peck, I'd like to say, has just been a, an incredible force at Penn State for pushing uh, educational transformation and the, the label I came up with, Kyle, this morning was the canary in the mine. I'm not sure if that's the right one, but maybe a prophet in, in his I own like land. I like the sand in the oyster that causes the pearls. <laughs> yeah, that's, a that's a great idea. So uh, Kyle has been one encouraging. Your retirement, so you should be worried. The canary <laughs> in the mine has taken off. I'll call you sand or a canary or, or a prophet. But whatever, Kyle has been one who's really forced us to think differently at Penn State about how we can be using the power of technologies and new pedagogies and has had a wide range of uh, projects and directorships over the last several years. So, so I'd seen an article that Kyle Bowen had um, participated in in the Educause Review last fall looking at trends in higher education where he, he was one of four panelists and I thought that's really an interesting idea. Then I thought about Kyle Peck and I thought well Kyle's been so involved in Penn State and pushing and encouraging us to think differently about things. And I thought, what a great combination, these two. So thank you for agreeing to do this today. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Great. It's uh, my pleasure to work with Kyle Bowen, one of my heroes in the ed tech space. Glad to see all of you. And uh, thank you for the invitation, Larry. So one of the reasons I'm really excited about this is that this is an amazing moment in the history of education in the world. Uh, some people have called it a while back on a wired editorial, Renaissance version 2.0. Things are going to change really rapidly here. At the, I'm, I'm wondering if, there is, if there's an end to this period. You know, like we people say, it, was, it started here and ended here. I don't think so. I think that the rate of change is going to be amazing, and the opportunity for us to do good things for learners is significant. Today we're going to start with an opening question, a little something I want you to think about as we talk today. Then we'll talk very, very quickly. We have so much to talk about in so little time. So we're going to be going bang, 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 bang through this. Learners and learning. We're going to do an overview of new options in two flavors. We're going to look at technology options that are coming around. And then some uh, new, in question mark, approaches. Things like competency-based learning, prior learning assessment, things like that that can really change the way education happens, even though they're not necessarily new. We're going to talk about the speed at which this is all taking place. We're going to talk about Penn State and the future, and then we're going to throw it up into a big discussion where we can just all roll around in that uh, for a little while. So just a couple days ago, I was reading an article about learning analytics, and they talked about how learning analytics is a pretty big thing, but realistically, people are finding out now who's likely to fail, uh, but that link between the data analytics and knowing and doing something about it is really rare. In that same article, they asked a really good question. They said, if you could predict with 100% accuracy the people who are going to struggle and or fail in classes or programs or even at the whole graduation level, what would you do to intervene and to change that predicted outcome? 
So with that sort of in our minds, we're going to talk about technologies and new options we have, and we're going to talk about new approaches with, you know, with, in thinking that maybe you know, it is our job that we can design for success for everybody. Uh, some people say that our current system is really more about sorting people. So we march people through our process at our pace, and the ones that comply and meet our demands go this direction and the others go that direction. But I'm not sure, you know, I think it's desirable for success for all, but maybe this system is set up that it, it really can't do that. But I think if we don't do that, if we don't design for success for everyone, others will. And people will increasingly choose an option where they know they're going to be successful, they know that it's going to adapt to their needs and their backgrounds and so on. So with that, quick reminder about learners, they're all incredibly different. One size does not fit all. They're different in a number of ways, including prior experience and prior knowledge in terms of aptitudes. I, don't, I put a question mark after that because I'm not really sure I believe aptitude isn't just a combination of other things like prior knowledge and uh, confidence and you know, self-regulation and things like that. Motivations, time and money to devote to learning, and a whole lot more. But if we think they're different, I put the size charts up here, if we think people are different physically, they're, even, they're so much more different when it comes to who they are, what they know, why they care, where they're headed, and all the you know, social connections, all these other things that really are important in learning. So what this, these differences are going to affect what they look for from providers of educational experience. I think one of our very first COIL conversations was with, was with Bill Sams. And somebody asked him, what can we do to help make sure Penn State's successful in all this? And he said, well, if you're asking that question, you'll fail. The question you need to ask is, what will learners need from us in the future? And so that's uh, something I want to hear. They're, they're now understand online commerce. I can go online and find really good information about even simple, trivial items I want to buy. Good information. I can see ratings. I can have so much information. I can have it customized and have it delivered to my house you know, in three days. That kind of ability is going to change over time. It's changing what people expect from us as learning providers. So learning, too, is, is very complex. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm feeling really bad here. Rain, Rain Sperling is an expert. I'm going to go stand in the corner and, and hide as I do this little reminder of learning. It's a very personal thing. It is personal. It's social at the same time. Learning with other people has profound impacts and the, the connections. It's not just me. It's my network of people that I'm learning with. Uh, it it's, can be stimulated, moderated, and inhibited by a whole lot of factors, including things like motivation, prior knowledge and experience, aptitude, again, and a whole lot more. In other words, it's not just this simple process of filling people's minds with, with new things, right, with new ideas. Uh, it involves a whole lot going on. It's not this. This is one image that I've seen recently. That what's happening there is the professor's putting books into this grinder, and one student who apparently doesn't get to wear the headphones, uh, you know, apparently those books are being ground into knowledge that's being fed into their heads. It's not that. It's not. There was an early World Campus poster. I wish I had it where there were people who, you know, distributed geographically with their mind, their heads tipped open, and arrows were coming from Penn State into their the top of their heads. It's not that. It's not information transfer. It's a lot more complex than that. It's not that either. It's not gears. It's not mechanical. It's not. No matter how we try and diagram it, it's really pretty wrong. Uh, what's happening is there approximately, I looked this up yesterday, 86 billion neurons inside the human brain that are making connections all the time, whether we're trying to make them make connections or not. We are sort of learning, problem-solving beings. And as we go through life, we're making connections and we're acquiring new information. We are designed more or less to solve problems and see patterns and and do these things. And so it's not just a matter of telling people something. It's a matter of making it mean something to them and more and more and more. And we don't have time to get into that. Rain, I apologize, and anybody else who, who I've offended with that overview. But I just want to remind you of all that. So now we're going to switch over to my colleague, Kyle Bowen, who's going to take us through some technology options. Oh, thank you very much, Kyle. So you know, as we think about you know, our learners and, and how they've evolved and what some of the opportunities are, around engaging them, and then also that original first question around, well, what if we could predict? What would we do with that information? 
Um, and that, that brings up some really interesting new options around engaging our learners. Um, and we have a set of different ways of thinking. I'm going to actually, for sake of time, I'm going to jump through this and actually go to the more breakout version of this. So in the first is when we talk about and think about prediction. So this original idea of predicting at 100% accuracy. Well, let's talk about that technically for, for a moment. And we can begin to explore this uh, relative to data science. And we can take the things that we already know about our students, the ambient data, and begin to use that to model and understand and look at what are some of those likelihoods. And what now, it's certainly not 100%, and getting there is, is not realistic. But what does this look like? So some of the work that we've been doing in CLT is, is looking at just that question of beginning to apply those data science principles to the ambient data we have in place. This here is a uh, what we effectively kind of refer to as an animal chart. And the intent of this is to demonstrate or to show for each data point what is its uh, relational impact on predicting student success. And in this case, we're defining student success at a course level. Um, so looking at how, does a, how is a student likely to perform in any specific course. Um, and so the animals are really only there to show proportion that your, your previous semester GPA is much larger than uh, your high school GPA, which is a, a chicken down here, right? So it's a whale to a chicken. Um, and the reason we went with this is because these aren't hard, fast rules, right? These change, these are very fluid, and they're, they, they differentiate based on what you're trying to figure out. But generally speaking, this is how they remain, and then there's this kind of large all remaining variables component, which is like 50 or 60 data elements that make up this just huge chunk of what's going on, kind of like that school of fish. Now we, we've, through kind of experimentation, looked at, well, what does this look like? How can we predict? And so what we're able to do is, is generally predict accuracy to, to more or less a, a half letter grade, right? So a plus, uh, to within a plus or minus. So if we predict you'll get a B, that means you either get a B, a B plus, or B minus, and we'll predict that about 17 out of 20 times, right? So in, in terms of what our expectation is that, that that would be an accurate prediction. So essentially you're looking at an 85% likelihood that you're, you're predicting a grade to within a plus or minus. Right, so we can begin to look at and, and, and apply these kinds of data elements and, and begin to project that forward as part of a prediction. But the question becomes, what do you do with that information? Right, how do we apply it? And what are the ethics of knowing it? Now, in this case, we're using historical data, right, because essentially because of the kind of technical break with lion path data, that, that it's, it's not the same thing. So essentially, in this case, we're, we're doing all of our evaluations. So this, We'll, we'll have to revisit this as kind of new data comes in and then this begins to evolve. But it really begins to set in place what is, what is a model for beginning to understand that prediction and, and what impact is that going to have around the application of technologies going forward. So looking at that, one of those areas that we're beginning to look at is around OER. Now, Open Educational Resources has been around for, for a long time. Many people are already doing them. Many groups are already developing them, and this is fantastic. What we need to do is get to a point where we're looking at them uh, in a sustainable way. So how do we want to produce you know, open material that gets consumed and used in other places? But then also increasingly, the challenge is that we're not just talking about what is a textbook replacement, right? And so I always describe this as kind of like uh, the use of a textbook or replacement your textbook. It's kind of like using a horse to pull your car, right? The, the textbook format itself is this kind of unmoded format. So we shouldn't use the textbook as a gold standard for measuring kind of learning content. But it is the unit of learning content that we all kind of understand, so it's a place where we start. But increasingly what we're seeing is greater diversity in the types of materials we're talking about. Right? So what, we're, what has historically been a textbook replacement, which is really the, one of the, the earliest wins that can be made and one of the greatest cost savings that can be made, but also looking at homework systems and problem sets, but then projecting this forward as we begin to think about not only video, but the development of, of immersive media of different types. So how do we begin to understand what some of those elements are going forward? And I think part of the opportunity here is to look at what are alternative business models to the creation of open content, um, and how do we begin to work in collaboration with others, whether it be across our institution or across institutions, whether it be Unison or, or, or Big Ten, to begin to look at you know, how do we find common elements of there and kind of bring that together in a, more, in a sustainable way. 
as as I kind of step through these ideas, and, and really this this section was designed to appeal like to the eight d attention deficit your eight year old inside of all of us, right? So so it, some of these may mean a lot to you, some of them may mean far less to you, and that's it, that's entirely okay. And if if you're not finding it interesting, just kind of hold on, and I'll be into something new in just a minute. The um, so when we talk about learning spaces, this is really getting at what Kyle was talking about: is that learning is complicated, learning is messy, and 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 what we want to do are create authentic experiences, right? So so classrooms in themselves were a simulation of the real world, right? If we didn't have classrooms, if we didn't have teachers, how would people learn? Well, they would learn out in the world. They would learn through apprenticeship. They would learn by experimentation. They would learn by doing, right? And so. The classroom was an approximation of that in an attempt to bring it to scale, right? So if we get them all in the same room and we put an instructor in front of them, we can do this faster with more people. Um, but what that does, though, then it is it begins to homogenize what's going on, something that is very complex to begin with. Um, so at Penn State, what we've been doing is exploring what are alternative models for introducing classrooms and then doing that at scale. One of the first... Um, we, or one of the most recent examples of this is with the Blue Box Studio, which is in the Alt House building. And so this was a transition of what had been a lecture hall into a much more flexible learning environment. But the, this room was really designed around how do we create a room or a laboratory for experimental teaching, realizing that the room needs to evolve. So I can't just design a room and set it and forget it, that rather the room needs to evolve as new teaching methodologies are being developed. But also, alternatively, it requires support. It requires people to help think through, how do I do this? How do I approach this teaching? How do I redesign the instruction? And also the development of new research methodologies to understand what are some of those things that are going on. Again, trying to understand some of the complexities that are in place. Another example is the Invention Studio, which is actually just down the hall. And if you haven't seen it before, uh, take a look at it before you leave. Um, it's, it's, down at the, it's in the back of the Knowledge Commons. And the, uh, but the Invention Studio was really around that same idea of the idea of making has become increasingly popular. But the problem is that making doesn't gen generally apply to everyone naturally, right? Because not everybody is comfortable with the idea of making a thing. And so the Invention Studio was built out of the idea that we could begin to engage more people in the act of being creative, right? And thinking through problem solving and thinking through in, in applying critical thinking. Uh, in, in applying solutions development. And the Invention Studio becomes a safe place to do that, and it introduces a lower barrier to entry. And so it begins to move past it into kind of building these complex connections, or helping people build complex connections. And that's by applying fairly simple technologies, we can em embrace wide variety of disciplines. So for example, one of the early adopters of this was an English writing course. So they introduced making as part of the writing process. Uh, and here you can see here is an example of how people think through and they can construct at a very simple level. And this is like a home automation solution that somebody has kind of designed and built inside of the studio. And they can come to this and they can think through and explore some of these items either independently or, or as part of a small group. I'm not sure I have a blank screen there. Um, as we look forward now, the kind of next evolution of this is looking at immersive experiences. So immersive experiences can mean a lot of things. So if we look at kind of a, a, a hierarchy, if you will, they start with what are immersive film, right? So this is like when you go to the movies and you put on the headset and watch the movie, right? So it's 3D. We have 360 video, which is the next level of that. So you're capturing video in, 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 in an entire uh, hemisphere around you. Uh, the next level is virtual reality. So this is actually replacement of reality uh, through a headset. Uh, and then the next level of that is your mixed reality or augmented reality. You can, and they're, they're different things, uh, but generally this is where you're mixing what's actually happening with something virtual. Um, and each of these has their own advantages, disadvantages, based on how we're applying them or how we're looking at them. Um, but one of the challenges we're looking at is if we put it in context of our previous question of what does it mean to think about or how do we design physical spaces for virtual spaces? Meaning, if we're all sitting in a room having an independent virtual experience, then how do I design the room such that it's not necessarily an independent virtual experience? So one of the ways that we're doing this, uh, this month, opening March 2017, so it's still on track, I think, to open this month, will be our new Immersive Experiences Lab. It'll be located in the Agricultural Sciences Building. 
And it'll be the, the first of its kind to really kind of take on and look at that question of how do we create an environment for one, consumption, use of these kinds of creative, of, of these virtual environments, but then also to the creation of them. And so how do we help our students in the construction of that using these types of new technologies? So what is immersive media is not just a technology, but rather a stack of technologies to look at. Um, and, and so the design of this creates its own kind of interesting space challenges. And that's where, as you can see in the middle and, and also at the top, there's this pinwheel shape. And that's come through some experimentation to find out, so if I have a group of people who are sharing in a virtual experience, what's the right orientation to put them in? And that's where we, we've landed on this pinwheel shape uh, to be more or less the most efficient because what we find is, is if you don't give people a place to be, they tend to run into each other because they're essentially blindfolded. So you've heard, you've, you've heard the saying like herding cats. Well, this is like herding blindfolded cats, right? So it's an even more interesting space design challenge. <clears throat> A practical example in the virtual reality space uh, was work done with uh, Ann Clements in music education. And this is her technology called First Class. And it was really built around, initially, a Microsoft Connect solution where people could interact with it like a video game. But it has since been transitioned into a virtual environment where pre-service teachers can interact with virtual students as a way of practicing their teaching. And they can work on a number of different principles. So in this case, what this image is meant to do, so these are the students and how they appear to you inside of the virtual environment. And so the, the kind of photo person in there is meant to kind of replicate, this is what that environment looks like. So you're seeing it from the teacher's perspective. And, it, and the students will react based on how you interact with them, based on your physical proximity, based on line of sight, based on you know, calling on them. And when you don't engage them, then they do things like you know, get bored and fall asleep. And so they're meant to work like real students that way. And we can begin to apply these things moving forward. And that's really kind of a foothold of, as we think about these kind of simulated environments, we can think about artificial intelligence and how does it apply. Certainly, the EdTech Network's been doing a lot around kind of bringing new conversations to this with IBM Watson and others. And we have some really interesting examples of, of work already being done around AI. One of them uh, is, is a project we've worked on with Lee Giles for a while now around applying um, development of B-Book. And so B-Book is this idea of bionic books. So these are books that are developed by both a robot and a person kind of working together to explore an idea. Um, and so this is this notion of human-assisted computing that says, OK, you know, for a machine to do this on its own, it has a series of intellectual questions. And so it can engage a person in helping it try to figure that out and the construction new material. So through the development of this, we can then use that technology to do other things. right? So the creation of a textbook being just kind of the starting place. And then you can begin to get into the, the creation development of assessments, creation development of review material, even so far as to having like a brainstorming buddy kind of idea that I can give it something I'm thinking about, and then it can help me unpack some of those ideas. But a lot of this is based on, as we think about you know, Bloom's taxonomy and the, de the development of how do we begin to teach using AI, there becomes that separation to think about, okay, there's a certain amount of this that computers can teach us, right? We're already kind of seeing that in a number of ways. But then there's the top. And the question is, is to what degree can AI actually engage or facilitate some of the things in those higher levels of engagement? So thinking about the act of creation. And so that's through the, the, the B-Books technology. We already have courses that have used that to help students kind of create customized textbooks for their courses. And so we can begin to apply some of these notions at higher levels if we think about it a little bit differently. So with that, I'm going to transition back to Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. So new technologies emerging all the time. AI, I think, is, is going to be astounding in the next 10 years, just what we've seen in the last few years. If you extrapolate that out and, and apply it to real problems in education, I think we're going to have real benefits there. But what I'm going to talk about now is sort of these approaches. What if we have all these technological ways to help people learn, but if we're still moving everybody at the same pace through a single you know, set of, of learning requirements, and if we're bundling them all in big courses and in big degrees, is that really meeting the needs of, of the learners that are going to be out there? So I think it's time for us to re-examine some existing approaches to learning, including competency-based education, prior learning assessment, um, and then new ways of, uh, of scaffolding assessment, and then 
digital micro credentials and I want to inform you about some new financial models. This is sort of like what else is happening in terms of not just technologies but technology affordances that let us do things differently. So a big one is competency-based education which is really just organizing the learning so that we're assessing competencies which are really a combination of knowledge, skills, and attributes that come together to allow somebody to do something that's important in the real world. So this is usually a comp uh, uh, this approach is usually combined with authentic assessments, which are measuring the things that people are really going to have to do once they're out there in the job. Kyle mentioned a great centuries-long tradition of apprenticeships. Well, there you had someone work alongside you, and they actually did what you did, and then you would stand back and say, you're ready. But we have moved way away from that. But now that more and more work is done online, and with other people even collaborating online, it becomes more and more possible for us even to do work-related apprenticeships through um, and have them build things that are actually authentic. Another thing that comes along with competency-based education is this belief that our job is not just to give people one chance and then sort them, label them with an A, B, or C, or D, and then slide the good ones over here and exit the, the bad ones, but our job is to provide them experiences that allow them to learn it. The kinds of things Kyle talked about and more are really available more and more online to individuals. And so there's really no reason why if someone needs additional assistance, we can't offer that. We can't channel that person through that and use the data analytics that he talked about to say other people like Matt, when they were having trouble with this, were successful when given this option or that option. Let's try, you know, and we keep track of what works for whom and we end up prescribing much like online commerce, again, says other people who like this. If you like this video, you'll probably like this one. Or you bought this, you'll probably want to buy this. If we start doing that in learning and understanding what people do, we can really make good suggestions and allow people multiple opportunities to move along a pathway. Those pathways of competencies can even be rearranged based on somebody's future. Uh, I have one Matt in here. Another Matt that, he, that is a friend of this Matt came to me and said, I can't find an undergraduate degree that's right for me. I really want to be like a video blogger. It's not really communications. It's not really ed psych. It's not really learning and you know learning design and technology. It's sort of a combination of those. Well, shouldn't he be able to put things together and create his own pathway through that? Or we should say we have a recommended pathway. He says, well, I can. I don't need the video production. I hear it's a video I've done. So try it. If you're great, if you're done. We'll certify that. If you're not, we'll say, try again. Here's some good feedback. Try again, rather than just moving people along at a constant pace. I mentioned the pathways part, so I'm going to move right past that. So when this happens, employers are more sure that the person they hire is going to have what they, they're looking for. Um, it can save time. It can save money. It can help students understand more what they're capable of doing. We've been having some conversations with a, a uh, employee relations, no, with career services. And they've been, <laughs> where did I get employee relations? Maybe because I'm retiring, I'm, that may be in my <laughs> age. So it, with uh, career services. And employers are saying, you know, I, I sit down with somebody in the interview and I say, tell me, so tell me why I should hire you. And they say, well, I took Econ 419 and I have this and I have that. And, and they're not really saying, well, I can lead a, a team. You know, they're not really able to describe these. So if we competency base it, and they know what they had to do to earn that. Now they're able to say, here's what I did to earn these credentials that I have, which brings us into micro-credentials a little better. OK, good enough, close enough. So prior learning assessment, people learn things without us. And we should honor that. And say, if you can prove to us that you know those things, we're not going to make you learn them again. We're not going to put you in a class that's 18 weeks long just because you don't have this two-week piece of it. We should say, let's modularize things and let people prove to us they can do what they need to do. This is called prior learning assessment. It's not giving people credit for work experience, where we're just tossing credits up, saying, oh, you've worked, you were in the military for five years, great, here's 30 credits. <coughs> it's quite different. You prove to me you know something, or prove to me you can do something, and we'll give you credit for it. And by the way, we'll take some money from you for, for doing that assessment. It'll cost you maybe 20% of what it would have cost you to actually take the course, but you'll move faster. By the way, I see us using graduate students to do a lot of those assessments to fund graduate students as they move through their programs. So it shows respect for what people learn. 
we need to do that. It's not about us, it's about learn. Prevents redundancy, saves time. President Barron has a couple of priorities. One is saving money, reducing the cost to degree, and the other is in, in decreasing the time to degree. Prior learning assessment can help us with that. We can handle more students for a shorter period of time. It doesn't take any, you know, it, it's not a net loss when we let people move through more quickly. I think I heard we had more applications than any other university last year. There's no shortage of people who want to come here. Let's move people through at an efficient pace and let's serve more people. So this is an interesting one. The hardest part of all this, especially if you're doing competency-based stuff, is measuring the stuff that really matters out there. Assessment is time consuming. Assessment is not as much fun as doing this, what I'm doing right now. This is fun, right? But assessment's hard work, but it's really important. That's where the learning happens when you're talking about higher order, the top level levels that Kyle showed you in that Bloom's taxonomy, those are developed through feedback, through trial and feedback and improvement and feedback and around and around. So that's real work that takes real time, but tools that can scaffold that. What if we built AI into looking at those tools? What if we did a good job of creating peer assessment uh, mechanisms where people submit first to peers and get peer feedback? Giving peer feedback is good learning experience too. So why don't we spend some time and energy applying technology to this, and, and people are doing, starting to do that. Some of us here at Penn State have been working on rubric processors for uh, decades to try and give good feedback to people and, in a more automated and efficient way. If we can do that, we'll ask people to do more higher order work, right? If a, this, just take a simple example. If a, you're teaching composition and you ask a group of 60 students to write a three-page paper, You've got 180 pages to read and give feedback on. You're not going to be able to do that very often. But if we can have artificial intelligence step in and provide some feedback and we just look at it afterwards, things like that, we can ask them to do more of that. Doing more of that leads to more development in that, and that's where I think a big uh, improvement is going to come. Everybody wins. Digital micro-credentials. You've probably heard me on my soapbox about this. It's a, an electronic credential. You click it. You see what they had to do to to earn it, you can click again and see evidence, see what they turned in, see the assessment. Those can be combined to, into a rich description of somebody's readiness for a certain role or career. Uh, and those micro-credentials can be read by computers, which means in the future people are going to be scanning metadata about you and inviting you to apply rather than you applying to you know, dozens if not hundreds of, of jobs for which others are uh, might be better qualified. Last thing I want to talk about in this area is new financial models. Some universities out there are starting to break this, you pay your tuition at the beginning of semester kind of thing. Learn all you want for a certain amount of money in a fixed time. All right, so $99 a month was the first one that came out. Online learning, take as many courses as you want, $99 a month. Then there's learn this topic for this price. Pay us the price and take as long as you want, as long as you need to move through that. Again, these things are difficult for Penn State to, to uh, accomplish. Then there's even some recently learn and then pay after you get a job. So come in, you know, and the, some of these are even, like, there's one in London where people even come, they have a place to work together, they're peer tutoring, they're doing all this stuff. You don't pay anything on the way in, but after you're out and you get a job, you pay 10% of your paycheck until it's paid off. And then there's pay a bit more. This is a Udacity one where they say, you complete this, uh, what are they calling them? Um, nano degree, right? We will get you, you will, we will help you find a job. And if you don't have a job within two years, if you pay us one third more money, we'll give you all your money back if you're not employed in that field in two years. So that's, they're really starting to get creative out there and it's hard for us to move in that direction, but that's who we're competing with, people who are flexible like that. So, evolution or revolution? So is this going to happen slowly or is this going to happen quickly? In other words, can we allow, so given the rate at which things are happening, will an institution that chooses an evolutionary approach, as most do, get there? And I'm defining there as a place where a model that's attractive to learners. Before other institutions that are able to change quickly or don't even have baggage to change, but just design something from scratch, eat our lunch. And that, you know, a lot of colloquial stuff in there, but I think you're, you're with me on that, right? In other words, we, it's not just about what we want to do. 
It's about what other people are doing. And it's not just about what other tradition-bound institutions are doing. It's about the whole cosmos of learning opportunities that are firing up out there. And as Kyle can tell you, the, the level of uh, investment capital in educational organizations has been increasing dramatically. So we switch into the Penn State in the future. And with that, I throw it back. Oh, no. sure. <laughs> Thank you. So if we think about, like, how, so what do we do with this information? Like, how do we apply it as we go forward? How do we think about it? How do we transition from, hey, we identify this as a trend. How do we transition that into some kind of action? Uh, and I had a colleague explain it to me this way a number of years ago, and I really like this idea where we are, we are familiar with kind of the technology adoption curve, right? The, the idea that there are early adopters at one end, there are kind of laggards that exist at the other. Um, and if we look at and apply on top of this, though, the impact that these technologies have is that it slopes downward as well. So the greatest impact that technology has is at its dawn. As it's coming in, it's at its most disruptive. Um, but then over time, what happens is that it becomes more and more common. And as it becomes more and more common, the price of it begins to come down. Right? So it's at its most expensive, both intellectually and financially, at the very beginning, right? So think about, for example, the first person who ate an oyster, right? You look at that oyster, how hungry would you have been to look at that oyster and say, look, that's something I'm gonna eat, right? But after the first person did it, right, they, they made that leap, they made that jump, everybody saw that they didn't die, everybody saw that they were fine after they ate the oyster, and so they can come along too, until the point it becomes common, right? Oh, we're eating oysters all the time now, right? Not a big deal. And we see this with technology. But the problem or challenge becomes what happens when you're in the top portion of this, meaning you're taking on more or less the same level of risk, the same level of cost, but you don't get to be first. Because first is everything. Right? And so that's where I think we need to be as an institution is being first, not fast following. Right? To say who, who, has to, who could be the first ones out? We're large enough as an institution we can do this. We have world-class faculty. We can do this, right? So we can look at these things and, and create first of their kind. And I think that's the opportunity for us as an institution is to begin to challenge assumptions based on what are the needs, right? So this evolved kind of Maslow-ish hierarchy where now we're starting with Wi-Fi and power, right? So how do we begin to redefine what some of these assumptions are that we make about the things that we do? And I think a big part of that is through experimentation, right? Is through looking at and piloting and seeing how do these things work? What effects do they have? Or do they generate revenues or not? Do students learn or not? Do they have the desired effect? Are they more authentic or not? And I think these are the opportunities. And that's, I think, our response as an institution is to do more things, right? Is to thoughtfully scale up and pursue it in a lot more ways. Because we as an institution, that's our business. We do that all the time. Neil deGrasse Tyson famously said that the, the dinosaurs died because they lacked thumbs and a space program, right? They, well, the interesting part about that is that, well, if they just had a space program, right? Well, we are. We are our own space program. We can innovate around our own. We can develop science around the things that we do, right? And so this is, I think, our opportunity, that we have that capacity. And as a research institution, it's our goal. It's our job to do these kinds of things. And so that's, I think, a big part of our response is to venture into areas of greater uh, experimentation and even riskier uh, areas of study. So you, this, you like this? This is my high-tech uh, animation here, see? So, proof I have too much time on my hands. Okay, so when it comes down to it, yes, we'd love to see Penn State out there being our own space program, but, you know, we need to have a little respect and understanding of our leaders here, right? So these are not easy decisions for Penn State to say, we want to be first with all these things. So Kyle used the term fast followers. And I have a, one in there that says, Penn State tends not to lead, but not to be far behind. They don't want to lead, but they don't want to be far behind, because that's safe. But Kyle showed you a pretty compelling argument why we might want to do that. The point is, if we're going to move, so who, who even has the power to say, we're all going to do this? at a place like Penn State with faculty senate and department heads and academic this and that. This, if we're going to move in important ways, it's really going to take 
a, a sort of a ground up and a top down kind of movement. It's going to take all of us at all levels saying this is something we embrace. The places I'm seeing that, I'm seeing it, it's interesting, I'm seeing it at the places you might not expect it from. The people that have these great reputations, the MITs and the Stanfords and places like that are the ones who are really sort of pushing for it to be innovative, even though they have the most secure positions on the chart. So this, we see this as kind of a call to action. That's a term Kyle used when we were putting this together. You know, it's time for us to go ahead and, and move forward. We have leaders who, who, I believe, want to do this, but they know how hard it is. But it gets a lot less hard if we're coming up with ideas and if we're sort of helping them move in, in desired direction. A comprehensive university doesn't just have to be about how many different subjects we offer, but maybe how many different approaches we have, how many different audiences we serve. And with that, I'll say there are three types of people in the world. People who watch things happen. People who make things happen. And people who wonder what happened. Right? So I don't think Penn State's likely to be in the third category. Uh, I think we're more likely to be one of the leaders. Uh, but what do you think? It's time for us to, to chat. Thank you, uh, Kyle and Kyle. Uh, I, that, was, that was terrific. And what I really appreciated by your approach is the uh, examination of the technologies that are going to be impacting us where we can provide leadership. And then, Kyle P., your, your model of the different disruptors and influencers on, on changes in education. So we'd like to engage the audience. So if you have questions, uh, let us know. Just put your hand up, and we'll get a, a mic to you so uh, our guests online can hear as well. We've got one, Jack. Well, a gr great presentation. The, the question that I've always had is, uh, in terms of Penn State, what is truly paradigm shifting at Penn State in terms of education? I mean, you've talked a lot about, I think, what is currently being innovated. But again, that's kind of behind that first part of the curve that you presented. What is Penn State doing in terms of education that is truly new, innovative, incredible? And if the answer is we don't know, how do we develop a culture that allows that to happen? So, so I think there are, um, so, so I, what you're asking is, is the right question. And, but the challenge is that I, I don't believe that there is a paradigm shifting thing in the same, same way and scope that, let's say, the internet came in and it changed fundamentally a number of things. What we're seeing now is more specialization. right? So we're seeing a number of things that will change how we do business. And that's where a lot of the methodologies that, that, or, or approaches, fiscal models that Kyle talked about, are a part of that, no one of them completely kind of unhinges what's happening currently, but all of them together are this disruptive force, that all of these new different ways of doing business. So really what we're talking about is a diversification of our kind of teaching and learning portfolio, right? That it's not just credit-bearing courses and or certificates, but rather a wide catalog of options. And as we talk about the technology, as technologies come along, they one, enable some of those things, but then two, they become the thing that inspires new methodologies. Right? Immersive media has that opportunity to introduce an entirely new modality the same way the internet did. Um, now, are we there? No. But we need to kind of figure out what does that trajectory look like? Will that replace higher education? No, it doesn't do that either. And so, but it is a, a, it becomes a new option. And I think that's how we kind of do this going forward is that I don't think that we're looking at a place where there is one really big disruptive force, but many smaller ones um, that, 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 that kind of, that we need to engage in different ways based on the, the benefits of each. And, and I'd add that there, there really are no paradigm shifting uh, innovations going on here at Penn State. But I think, again, it depends on how you define a paradigm. So was the MOOC, was a massive open online course, a paradigm shift? Maybe. But I'll say, so I went back and said, well, the paradigm used to be you come to us, right? And then in the early 1900s, I think, 
or maybe even been in the late 1800s, we decided correspondence education. So there was a paradigm shift. You don't have to come to us. Then that kind of got expanded with open education. The, the next paradigm shift I'm seeing, perhaps, is right now the paradigm is you play by our rules. We define what it is you need to know. We set prices. We set you know, pathways. We set everything. Uh, and, and the new paradigm might be you tell us what you need. You know, and we, when we have things together and you can assemble your own program. So this idea of Stanford 2025 was a visioning thing that, that Stanford did. They separated separate, different teams out. And one of the proposals that came through that process was instead of a major, you come to Stanford with a mission, you know, something you want to do in the world. Right? So instead of coming and being an econ major, you might say, I want to eradicate poverty in Cleveland. And so then they would say, oh, you want to eradicate poverty in Cleveland? Well, what, how, what do we have that we can line up that would help you? You're going to need some communications courses. You're going to need some economics courses. You're going to need some you know, study and maybe do an independent study on uh, microfinance, uh, you know, other things like that. And they would put it together. And then another was looping. Instead of coming and staying for four years, which is the current paradigm of four to six, it's really, you know, you come in, you learn a little bit, you go out and you try it. And then you loop back in for more. Come back and say, well, that worked. I got, that's a good start. Now I have these new questions and new things I need to explore. And it's sort of an ongoing relationship with a, with a parent institution. So I say we, we're not breaking paradigms now, but there may be a few in our future. Cindy. So in, instead of any kind of set curricula, you're almost um, offering a menu of learning opportunities. Is that where you see it going? Yeah, that could be. So, and those learning opportunities could be combinations. So it might be, you know, there, there might be these different modules of competencies, right? And so it might not be a full Chinese menu with just, you know, column A that's three pages long, but it might be a sort of here's a, a set of modules that you can take or leave uh, and maybe test out of one of them. So it might not be individual components, but yeah. And, and there would be advice because Someone heading for a career doesn't really know as much about that career as they should if they're designing something. So I see it as a co-creation of a set of modules that works for somebody. So I know we have a question. Is that Kyle? If I go to the next, um, we have a question online. We'll, uh, Brad will channel it for us. So there's a a bit of discussion back and forth online uh, asking. Uh, do professors still know what is required to perform in the workplace after being out of the industry for, or uh, being a professor and out of industry for 20 years? Kyle, would you like to speak on behalf of all professors? <laughs> yes. Some do. Uh, anytime we talk about a whole lot of people, you're wrong about a lot of people. But there is a relatively weak connection between the world of work and the university in some fields. In others, it's very prominent. Uh, so that's an, it depends on that. Is it a, it, the, the person's coming from an assumption that I, that's a good thing, and I would second that assumption and say that one of the, another thing that competency-based learning does in general is it works with people in the field to identify what those competencies are and how to assess those. Terrific. Thank you. Brad, do you want to do another one, and then I'll come back to David? Sure. Uh, what will be the value of a college degree 10 or 20 years from now? College degree, in quotes. No? Yeah, Kyle has a great image of a transcript. It's blurred out so you can't see all the grades. Then he overlays a Walmart receipt on top of it and points <laughs> out that the transcript is really like a, a receipt. And a degree doesn't differentiate you from anybody else. It sort of puts you in a great big category with zillions of other people. So the value of a degree, I think, will deteriorate. It tells people things. It tells people you spent a lot of time that was probably well spent. You are relatively compliant, relatively punctual, uh, but it doesn't separate you. So in the future, as these alternate, alternate credentials come out, and they actually have evidence, and people can rearrange them to show how they fit jobs, I think the value of a degree will decline. I think it'll take decades. And it may be that people end up dropping the requirement for the degree and uh, just accepting these credentials. A friend, David Wiley, when digital micro-credentials and badges first came out, proposed a project called or equivalent. So people say a bachelor's degree or equivalent. He was saying, let's figure out what the equivalent is, and let's create a set of micro-credentials that add up to that. 
So you may even see something like that happen. So I, that, I think the, the, the basic assumption is, if we think about the college degree, that, that's to assume it doesn't evolve. Right? And so as we talk about what we're looking at today, I mean, we're talking about an evolution of the institution, which will require an evolution in how do we grant credentials.